Welcome to the Queen Anne's County Board of Education. May I have a motion to go into closed session? As permitted by Section 3-305B of the General Provisions Article of the Annotated Code of Maryland, I move that we go into closed session to discuss a personnel matter that affects one or more individuals, to review the Human Resources Personnel Report, to discuss FY18 budget strategy, to discuss collective bargaining negotiations, to review several administrative items, an appeal, minutes from May 3rd, 17th, and 23rd, to consult with counsel to obtain legal advice on a legal matter, to review upcoming meetings and events. May I have a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. We are now going into closed session and we will be back at 6 p.m. Good evening. Welcome to the Board of Education meeting. This is a public speak. meeting that is being videotaped for county citizens on QAC TV 7, a local cable station. The agenda is available on the information table. During this meeting, we ask that you turn off your cell phones and hold personal conversations and comments outside the meeting room. We will now stand and be led, by the, uh, uh, led in the Pledge of Allegiance by our Board Vice President, Annette DiMaggio. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Your turn. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. I need a second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. May I have a motion to approve the minutes from May 3rd, May 17th, and May 23rd? So moved. May I have a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. Mr. Peluski, will you lead us through the recognition? Absolutely. 3.01. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to our board meeting. Tonight we would like to express our appreciation and thanks for the efforts of our talented students. Our Hero Award. The QACPS Hero Award is sponsored by the Anti-Bullying Committee and Character Counts. This month's Hero Award will be given to Abby Madison, please come forward. Audrea Valentino, please come forward. Kitty Kennedy, please come forward. Italia Guzman, please come forward. Clara Vornbrock, please come forward, and Sydney uh, Petalano, hopefully I pronounced that right, please come forward, all from Mattapique Elementary School, and our ask our principal to please join us. Ms. Schreckengost is here. Mrs. Schreckengost nominated these students for this month's award. There are many ways to report and respond to bullying, but these young ladies made the hardest decision of all. They stood up against bullying. Mrs. Schreckengost and myself are grateful to all of you for setting an example of bravery, compassion, and character for all of us to follow. You stood up for what was right that day. And you've continued to stand up for yourselves and one another each day since. Thank you for being such great role models for your peers. You not only showed your peers how to stand up to bullying, but you also showed them how to put an end to bullying. Thank you for being so courageous, kind, and compassionate for all the students at Mattapique Elementary School, but more importantly, for everyone, not only in the entire Queen Anne's County Public Schools, but in Queen Anne's County. I'm so proud of you for standing up for someone else and doing what's right. You are all an example for all of us to follow. Thank you very much and congratulations.
I'll take take a step back a little bit. We'll be back. <laughs> Our Shining Star Award. The QACPS Shining Star Award is awarded to a student who goes above and beyond every single day. Will Miss Riley Enzer of Churchill Elementary School please come forward, who is our Shining Star this month? She was nominated by Miss Quigley, the PE teacher. If she is here, please join us. Uh, is is um, our principal? Uh, yes, yeah, Miss Wilhelm, would you please come forward? <coughs> Riley is kind-hearted, determined, and a hard-working young lady whose spirit has helped every student at Churchill Elementary School be the very best that they can be. She goes above and beyond and exemplifies a true leader in the community outside of being the president of student council. She participates in service learning projects, promotes kindness towards others. Riley proves she was a real shining star when she put another student's goals before hers. The Girls Ready to Run program at Churchill Elementary School runs a 5K every year. This was the first year with a Boys Ready to Run program and Riley often attended their practice before school to help the autistic student run. During the 5K race, instead of um, competing in, in front of the top score, she ran beside her friend that she had been helping all season. She ran alongside him and helped him reach his goal that no one thought was possible. Seeing Riley and him cross the finish line together, that day truly shows how Riley shines at Churchill Elementary School. Thank you for being such a great mo role model, Riley, and making every student shine to be their best. And thank you for being another great example of what's great about Queen Anne's County Public Schools. This is a, our special recognition for History Day. Queen Anne's County Public School holds a local History Day whose winners then go on to the Maryland State History Day competition. This day is for middle and high school students to critically think to develop skills in research and analysis, writing, and public speaking. These students are permitted to work solo or in small groups to create an original documentaries, exhibits, performances, research papers, or websites to explore the breadth and depth of historical topics within an annual theme. This year's theme was Taking a Stand in History. The statewide contest was held at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County on April 29, 2017 with over 27,000 students, participants from over 200 schools and 22 school districts. Queen Anne's County Public Schools was proud to have winners from both Centerville Middle School and Mattapeak Middle School. As I call your name and award, please come forward. First, we have Mattapeak Middle School's Samantha Beck, Elise Parks, and Sophia Serena, winning the Major, Major General John uh, e. Morrison Award in Excellence and Innovation for a performance about Elizabeth Blackwell's journey into the medical field. Next, we have William George from Centerville Middle School winning the Milton Zaslow Award in Cryptology for his documentary on the Navajo Code Talkers. Finally, we have Ava Guerrero, Olivia Marshall, Abigail Reynolds and Victoria Zhang from Centerville Middle School winning a special award in historical preservation for their group exhibit on the preservation of Assateague Island. Would their teachers, Mr. George and Mr. Heyman, please come forward as well. 
Queen Anne's County Public Schools had another win the Maryland History Day that was for the History Teacher of the Year. Would Mr. Andrew Anders please come forward as well? We want to recognize these students and these fine educators for not only their achievements at Maryland History Day, but for their hard work day in and day out, and for being such great representatives of Queen Anne's County and Queen Anne's County Public Schools. On behalf of the Board of Education, thank you for your excellence every single day. The principals are here. Their principals are here. If I could have both of the principals. Um, Please give them a round of applause. Okay, okay. And I'm I supposed to read you? Yes, you keep reading me. This goes to the wall. There's no book. Oh, okay. I want to say goodbye to my family. Sure. I'll give them a few minutes to move out. It's kids that help that Hispanic. Yeah, Atalia was Hispanic. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 At this time, we will move on to citizen participation and public comment. We ask that all speakers keep in mind the following guidelines. <coughs> speakers should sign the roster, including their telephone number and address. Comments should be limited to two minutes in length. Comments longer than two minutes should be submitted in writing. Questions or statements to the board should relate to a recent agenda item, an agenda item that is expected to appear in the future, or a matter of general policy over which the board has authority. Please do not discuss items related to negotiations. Those items are to be discussed at the bargaining table. Citizens' participation is not intended to be a question and answer session. If you have specific questions, the board will make sure an appropriate staff member responds to your question at a later date. The board respects your desire and your right to convey your message freely, but asks as a courtesy to the board and our citizens that you respect the board's request to refrain from naming citizens and name calling when offering your critique. And our first signed up name is Ms. Deborah Lawrence. Good evening, Mrs. Lawrence. Good evening, Mrs. Maggio. And good evening, all rest of the board members. And good evening, Superintendent. Good evening. Um, Good evening. I know I have two minutes, so I'm going <laughs> to get started. All right? I'd like to begin tonight with a quote by Dr. Martin Luther King that, that truly represents my feelings this evening. Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. I knew sitting here would be tough, was going to be tough, but I had to, I have elected to do the right thing and not the easy thing. To do what is right and just is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. I know we're not supposed to do that, but I had to say that. Now, what is just and what is right? To listen as a teacher declares to a class that they have targets on their backs. This class has a large number of IEPs in 504, and a real teacher was not in that room for 12 weeks. Not right nor just. To have a certain amount of students participate in the senior prime Three of them were allowed to walk, and by the way, the investigation is ongoing, and a partial punishment was issued. 
total, not right, not just. To listen to a proclamation from a veteran teacher that everybody around here must be afraid of the big black boys. Not right, nor just. To file a complaint about the non-compliance of 504 accommodations and then the big black boy becomes the problem. Not right, nor just. Statements made, like I'm going to hold graduation over his head. Your grandmother doesn't work here anymore. Now who's going to save you? Not right, nor just. I've got actions that are in here and the board can read later, but since I'm refrained or have two minutes only to do what I have to do. To describe the due process procedures when questioned as a confusion not right nor just. With seven and one half years at the administrator as Queen Anne's County, I first asked with dignity, dignity and integrity to walk in with the staff during the evening of the gala. On May the 31st, 2000, I, read, I received a response via email that I was walk, welcome to sit in the Board of Ed section with the other guests. I was not advised to wear a cap and gown, and most of the participants were allowed to wear formal graduation gowns, and they were re recognized in the principal's speech. Not me not right nor just. Now, all of this is not a letter of doom and gloom. There are some things that are right and just. 15 seniors from both high schools were able to graduate because of the credit recovery program at Anchor Points Academy. Thank you, sir, for allowing that to happen. 15, right and just. Two men were hired by Mr. Engel that worked with our male students once they got out there to teach them to be men. The people that made it right and just, I want to recognize them because I have only two days, and these people mean a lot to me. Mr. Brad Engel, a truly a deal maker. Ms. Janet Pauls, working endlessly to promote diversity in Queen Anne's County. Mrs. Schindler used technology to assist the students with their right of patches of graduation. And finally, Bishop Taylor, who prayed with me when I didn't know what to do. Ladies, the struggle still continues for righteousness, justice, and freedom of truth-isms. We must have zero tolerance for the evil stepsister called ignorance and arrogance. President George W. Bush stated, a good nation, and we can put district, does not hide or ignore its history. It faces its flaws and corrects them. Now it's time, ladies, to conform to a standard of correctness known as justice. I look to the future. <clears throat> My life is done. My grandson, who I was referring to, is done. I'm going to get done. But I look to the future for my four-year-old granddaughter that sits in the audience. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lawrence. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Elsie Lawrence. Oh, he passes off. I, I took him two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, Tag team. Richard McNeil. <laughs> Good evening, Richard McNeil. Um, just want to let the board know that the uh, retired educators group gave two thousand uh, dollar scholarships out this year again. Um, and if it's okay to name the names tonight, I, I like to honor them. Uh, from Queen Anne's High School, it'll be uh, Sabrina Smallwood uh, Corcoran, who will be going to Wesley College, and from Ken Island High School, <laughs> Mary Mulligan, who will be going to Mount St. Mary's. So we congratulate them, and uh, uh, we're going to honor them in, at, at our luncheon this coming Tuesday. So if you're in the area, please stop by. Um, the other thing I want to mention is that uh, being a mentor uh, for the last several years, we have completed another year 
Um, we had our meeting on Monday to sort of summarize things, and we felt it was a very successful year helping first and second year teachers get over the challenges of teaching and becoming professionals in their business. Uh, not all of them were smooth and successful, uh, but we felt that uh, we did a, a good job of helping to support them, and, and we appreciate that program. I uh, also want to give a thanks to uh, Kathy Draper, uh, who has been our facilitator and uh, a great leader for our monthly professional development programs. Uh, we meet monthly, and there's always been some, some kind of um, development to help us be better coaches and better mentors to the teachers uh, by asking good questions and follow up and having that one-on-one -on -one with them. So we appreciate that program, and hopefully it continues next year. Uh, we'd like to be able to do that. And um, from, the, from the retired group, we'd also like to just thank the, the board for their continued support of our health care. Uh, as you know, the health care around the nation on the federal level is, is questionable and in, in what's going to happen to it. And as they project into 2020 and even to 2027, uh, there being a challenge on that. So we appreciate uh, the, your support and continued support. And as we learn the names of those who are currently retiring, we welcome them into our group and we will be sending them a, a welcoming letter to, uh, to join us and uh, have the fun times that we have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. McNeil. Our next speaker, David Van Wick. Hi. Uh, Good evening. Good evening. I'm here just to uh, thank all of you, uh, first of all, for not uh, eliminating the positions uh, at the elementary schools for our media specialists. Uh, there is one more job that I think that you need to con uh, consider, and that's our, here at the board. We have a position that's called the Director of Digital learning uh, that I think we must keep. Um, how many of you have cell phones? Do you? Do you have a cell phone? I have one that I don't use. Don't, don't talk back. Do you have a cell phone? Of course. Of course. Uh, most of us have, have cell phones. I even have one, uh, believe it or not. Uh, when you get a cell phone, you get a manual it tells you how to use all the different different things most of us uh, take that manual at least i did i opened up the manual it's about this big it's about that thick and i couldn't read a darn word the print was too small first thing i did is i turned to somebody that i knew knew how to work the cell phone and say hey how do you get this to work and almost every one of us turns to somebody who's got experience and knows how to use it. If I want to say, hey, this thing has a calendar on it. Show me how the calendar works. She takes two minutes, shows me how the calendar works. If she didn't do that, would I go back and look in that manual? Probably not. I'd probably be stuck having a beautiful cell phone and not knowing half the things it can do. And most of us are like that. When I, uh, there's something new on the cell phone that I need, am I going to go dig out that manual and hunt for it? No, I go find somebody who uses that and say, show me. Or you're getting rid of the one person that our teachers can go to and say, show me. I wish you to consider that position. It is important, not only to the teachers, but for our kids. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Our next speaker is Daniil Fisher McGowan. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I just like to say, I wish to respond to the superintendent's letter written to Queen Anne's County Public Schools parents, guardians, families, and employees on May 3rd, 2017. While I appreciate the spirit of the letter 
and its intentions to call attention to the horrific climate of racial inequity which exists here in Queen Anne's County Public Schools. However, the letter does not go far enough to attempt to solve the problem. The letter mentions the 1994 Race Equity Audit Report conducted by the Maryland State Department of Education. I'm inclined, based upon recent occurrences, to believe that nothing was done to address the findings of that report. The steps to be taken in the future, according to the interim superintendent, Mr. Polinski, letter express good intentions but lack specifics and accountability. How and when would these recommendations be implemented? Who will be enforcing them? What are the consequences for infractions and not meeting expectations? How will the school and the community respond to these recommendations? The 1994 Race Equity Audit Report, 23 years ago, expressed the hope that critical, that current racially motivated incidents would, be, would not be, quote, swept under the rug. We hear, and you talked about equality must be for all. I call upon each of you to move this county from talk to implementation. There must be consequences for all who demonstrate acts of hatred and those who are responsible for their discipline and for whatever reason decide not to. That's it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Next speaker, Karen Fields. Good evening and happy almost summer. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Karen Fields. I'm president of the Queen Anne County Education Association. And I would like to thank Mr. Paluski for his leadership. The association has worked with him on issues that matter greatly to our students and to our profession. We have organized monthly meetings where members have had the opportunity to express issues of concern that range from scheduling to the efficacy of student learning objective process including the unreliability of many post assessments to inform educators regarding student growth, as well as the implementation of countywide initiatives and their interpretation at the individual building level. These are just a few of the items that have been discussed. More work is needed on a broad range of issues that affect classroom learning. QACEA looks forward to continuing this dialogue and having that partnership result in positive change. I would also like to thank the board for their fiscal leadership. I was pleased to speak alongside them at the commissioner's budget hearing in Sudlersville. I spoke in favor of Mr. Paluski's budget, and I spoke of the concern that I had for an underfunded budget resulting in problems with teacher retention and delivery of services to students. I am pleased that the elementary media specialist positions were restored, while I am concerned about the funding being stopgap. I received a very extensive reply from some of the commissioners and their staff regarding the funding of this year's budget. The response falls back on funding above maintenance of effort by 1.3 million being generous considering that QACPS has one more student next year. If schools were factories and students were widgets, this argument might hold true. But so much more goes into maintaining the level of services to our students that such calculations fall short. The third lowest budget presented to the commissioners in 16 years that actually made the employees a priority was refreshing. We will continue to work with the BOE and the county to ensure that educators and staff have the level of support needed to educate the commissioners next generation of constituents. I had hoped to sign the contract for certified and staff tonight, but I have learned that the tentative agreement um, is moving forward and that we will work really hard in the next two days to ratify before summer break. And uh, we'll be working with Mr. Farley to uh, make sure that the staff negotiations move along to a tentative agreement. I would like to thank Mr. Farley for the very cordial um, negotiations that we've had. I'd like to thank Mrs. Pauls for her support this year and happy summer. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fields.
That concludes our list of signed up. Anyone wishing to speak may do so now. The board. Good evening. My name is David Brown. I live in Chester Harbor. I've addressed this board many times before, usually with data. Let me give you one number tonight. 5,900. That's the number of laptops and Chromebooks we have in students' hands on a daily basis. That does not include the laptops in carts in our pre-K to two schools or the stationary labs or the teachers' uh, laptops they use daily. We currently have one person in this system that deals with instructional technology, and that's our facilitator of digital learning, and that position's set to be cut this year. We can't afford to lose that position. It's extremely important. We have one person that deals with the instructional side of technology. Currently, that position is filled by Christina Schindler, and she is amazing. She does wonderful things when she combines students, teachers, and technology. Please do what you can to save that position and keep her in it. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you. Mr. Brown. Anyone else? That concludes our speaking portion. Turn it over to Mr. Poluski. Well, Hi, actually, um, yes. Um, they're not here this evening, but they will be here for the July meeting. Um, this new student board members uh, for the Queen Anne's County Public School System will be Grace Parks, who will be at the Kent Island High School, and Sarah Sharber, who will be uh, Queen Anne's County High School's, um, yes, and they will be here for the July meeting. So now, um, Mr. Peluski, uh, would you like sure. to do the presentations? Sure. Uh, we'll start with uh, presentation 5.01, which is our summer construction project summary uh, that I believe Mr. Pinder is going to summarize. I don't know if Ms. Poland's going to be with you as well, Mr. Pinder? Or Not you? just myself. Okay. And this is going to be to give the board uh, an update on the projects that we anticipate that will com be completed over the summer. Good evening. Thank you. Mr. Pluski had asked me to go through a, uh, a short presentation on what projects we were going to uh, begin this summer. And going through this presentation, um, the purpose is to explain construction and maintenance projects that will occur over the summer. Our objective is to explain the priorities and selection process of construction and summer maintenance projects. Basically, when we look at projects, um, and they may come from principals, they may come from students, they may come from uh, faculty staff, we first put them in priorities. We look at safety, you know, OSHA, MOSHA complaints, fire marshal, um, other inspections of boilers, um, safety kinds of things. We look at security, such things as cameras, access controls, locks. A lot of those are identified uh, when we work with the Sheriff's Department and the Maryland State Police to identify those areas from our emergency preparedness drills. The third category is ADA. We're looking at ramps, sidewalks, motorized doors. Um, fourth is building comfort. And when I say building comfort, we're not talking about, you know, a uh, recliner and, and <laughs> couch. We're talking about, you know, heating and air conditioning um, for the students and staff. Building envelope, roof, windows and doors. And then we kind of categorize um, routine with paint, a dripping faucet, basically things that are everyday work orders for the maintenance staff. Funding, we basically have four different um, funding availability <coughs> routes. First one's capital, the second one's fund balance, third's operating budget, and the fourth is grants. Um, one thing I would like to point out, we may get out on, say, June 9th. But funding for capital projects and the operating budget and some of our grants does not become available until July 1st. So imagine we do have 40 days, working days this summer to complete things, but the funding doesn't become available until July 1st. So a lot of those projects will not start until after that. Um, the other 
area looking at funding you have to take into consideration is once you do the RFP, the contract is signed, the availability of the contractor to perform that work. So some of the items that I'm getting ready to go through, you know, will be started during the year. Some of them, the paperwork process will be started with the bids, um, you know, the MBE requirements that we have to fulfill. So what I did very quickly was I just broke down into the, the categories I gave you. Um, the safety summer projects, if you look at our schools, the entry matting, um, one of the OSHA areas identified, we really lack matting when you walk into the school, uh, basically setting ourselves up for a you know, potential lawsuit for that. Um, Bayside Elementary School installed generator, Centerville Middle School bleacher repairs, Graysonville Elementary School, we have a six classroom addition that we just had the groundbreaking ceremony for. Graysonville Elementary, we have the fire alarm, Ken Allen High School, the fire alarm, Ken Allen High School bleacher repairs, Mattis, Mattapique Middle School bleacher repairs, and Queen Anne's County bleacher repairs. We are trying to get the, as we did last year at Ken Allen High School, we sanded down the floor in the gym, really looks nice down there, we striped it. We had the funding available for that um, for this year for Queen Anne's County High School, and we're trying to work with the contractor to get in there before school starts. If we cannot do that, that will be one of those items that takes about a month to accomplish, so it will be done the following school year. But we do have the funding for it. Same thing with the generator. By the time we do the RFPs, the um, design documents, and have the approval by the IAC and the Maryland uh, Public School Construction Program, those items will be you know, occurring in the spring of next year. Security. Uh, as I've said in previous meetings, we have basically four access control systems. Um, we've identified um, one company that we're, we'll be using that will coincide with our security cameras. Um, we also identified from the Sheriff's Department some areas when we do the reverse evacuation that did not have access controls. This is a great opportunity when an employee comes to us, we can program their badge so that they have access to the building. If the employee retires or leaves, one simple click of the computer and we've taken care of that badge. We don't have to go hunt down the keys to have the keys returned and the keys go missing. Um, all, skill, all schools will have the temp shield blinds installed. Um, Churchill and Sellersville Elementary School starting on Monday. Uh, we will be working on the single point entry and also replacing the storefront. That should take about two weeks to complete at Sellersville Elementary School and then we'll finish up at Churchill. Um, Sellersville Middle School will be upgrading the outdoor and indoor lighting system. Some of the ADA issues that we are addressing um, is the first grade hallway at Centerville Elementary School that has um, some terrazzo issues with moisture underneath of it um, from many years ago that we need to take care of. And Centerville Middle School and Sellersville Elementary School have some sidewalk issues um, when you step over the curb the sidewalk is three to four inches below the curb, which creates a, a major safety issue and also ADA issue. Um, building envelope. We are um, trying to paint the exterior windows here at the Board of Ed. Um, we are also doing the exterior door replacement through capital funding at Sellersville Elementary School. That will begin the 1st of August and should be complete when school starts. The partial roof replacement will begin um, at the end of, uh, I'm sorry, at the beginning of August. Substantial completion will be done before school starts, and then we'll have some touch-up work on weekends as school begins. Um, as you can look up there, we have building comfort. Um, we have EMS systems where we have uh, Johnson controls. We need to upgrade servers, various boiler repairs. Um, we have some rooms at uh, Ken Island High School and Queen Anne's High School that uh, do not have air conditioning, that we are installing uh, ductless split systems in there so that they will have air conditioning. And there's, it's only one room at each school, so that will be taken care of. Um, boilers, we only have two boilers per school. So it's very important that we service those and take care of anything because if one goes down, it's hard to control um, just running one. And then routine summer projects. We always sand and seal all the wood gym floors, clean all the um, rubber gym floors. And then most importantly, our custodians clean a little over 1.4 million square feet. Um, and when I say clean, it is from top to bottom and bottom, you know, all over the place. They are an incredible bunch. Uh, very fortunate, like I said, we have 40 days this summer, 
but that does go by very quickly. We have nine maintenance workers that will be doing preventive maintenance on our chillers, air handlers, rooftops. Um, quarterly, we replace all the filters on our HVAC system. We have one gentleman that, that is his sole job of replacing every filter, um, quite a task. So we have the doors and locks, as you can imagine, with 7,000, over 7,000 students going in and out every day, need to be repaired. And then, of course, each principal turns in a summer maintenance list that we try to get through. So basically, in a nutshell, that's what we'll be doing this summer. Um, it's, it's a very busy time. A lot of people think that, uh, you know, summers are off, but that's our busy time. Any questions? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Pinner. Yep. 5.02 is an update on our equity plan, which will be Ms. Pauls, our assistant superintendent, and Mr. Engel, our supervisor of uh, student support services, to give us a little bit of an update. Good evening, Good evening, Vice President DiMaggio, Mr. Paluski, and board members. It's my pleasure tonight to present with Mr. Brad Engel, rock star, <laughs> as mentioned earlier. <laughs> uh, we have been asked to come back and provide some additional data. We did speak earlier in the year about our plan education that is multicultural. Since then, we've had uh, a chain of events that have speared some different types of discussions and so we've been asked to share some data so you'll see some familiar some things that are familiar and other things that are not quite as familiar so again our vision is to provide equitable equitable access we want to share really tonight some of the issues of discrimination and what the reporting practices are for those so we always want to keep this definition in front of you this is the definition from the state department which talks about what education as multicultural is and what diversity is. And I always point out the facts that it's not limited to just race, but it also looks at ethnicity, region, religion, gender, gender identity, language, social and economic status, et cetera. That's a critical piece of what it, it, it uh, is as defined. So as you can see, we have a number of committees. Um, Janet and I co-chair the uh, steering committee for the education that is multicultural. And through that, we have the, uh, a lot of other committees through, through the local management board. We have the multicultural proficiency, which does a lot of work with the community. And uh, we've done some work with focus group where we've reached out to, to teachers and parents. And there, of course, there's the uh, minority achievement or ETMC uh, task force and the steering committee. And like uh, Ms. Paul's alluded to, this has been a challenging year and we've had a lot of difficult uh, situations. And I know both of us uh, talk to parents quite frequently, and I, I yeah, and and we hear a lot of stories about uh, inequity um, in our schools among children. And uh, you know, we take this work very seriously. We believe it is it is difficult work, and that we have a lot of work uh, ahead of us. But we le we believe in in the good people of Queen Anne's County. Uh, we believe in our leadership and Mr. Paluski that we are headed in the right direction, and that. Um, you know that we've got a structure in place to address not only education that is multicultural but bias behavior as well so here's some of the issues that have been reported to us and i'm sure there are many issues out that are not reported as a result of the letter that was sent out by mr paluski then we started to have more issues to come in so reported incidents by level are uh, as presented and those issues reported by parents and students are a combination of discriminatory remarks made to students by uh, specific, specifically the race, some gender discrimination, and then unequitable practices for discipline. Um, you know, I also wanted to add, the, with the new bullying harassment form, it's been updated, and I will share that when we go over the bullying harassment, intimidation, and bias behavior policy, and there it is. There it is. And, they, there is a piece in there, it's new, where you can check racial harassment, and that is a new code that's going to be um, delivered to the Maryland State Department Edu of Education. Um, we have, since the superintendent's letter came out, we have seen an increase in reports 
and I'm getting reports uh, on a weekly basis, numerous reports. Um, I know a lot of schools, uh, or I guess a lot of people feel like it's, you know, it's a negative, but to me, that shows a dynamic reporting system when you, uh, when you create this, this system where people feel comfortable reporting because we know these things are occurring. So we want to hear about them. And if we don't hear about them, then that creates dysfunction. This was kind of hidden on each of the web pages, so it is now very visible. Geneva, thanks to Geneva, has made sure that it is very um, visible on all of the web pages at every school. And when you're talking race, you're talking um, African American, Hispanic, that all of those all mixed into one. Yes. Thing. Um, and and you're keeping data on uh, on the reports. Um, and I think I think it's important that it, it's it other than just right now snapshot now you're going to carry that on mm -hmm. because I found that on a, uh, a gender committee I was on with Department of Defense when we started improving the reporting and we it, the numbers went way up and and like you said we're happy it did because then people were reporting yeah. so then over time you could you could tell whether you were improving or not you're exactly right captain kelly and we report this information we're required to report this information to the maryland state department of education on an annual basis and it's public public information as well so yes we're happy to report that and 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 we feel like an increase shows that you know uh, we're making more of an effort to make the forms available. Right, because th th things have been happening for for years in this county. Well, and, and, and I'm, I'm going to be on. As good I'm years. sorry, I'm going to be honest that when I talked to some parents, they didn't even know about the form. Oh. So we want to make sure that it is. And this is, you know, talking to parents uh, in, in recent months, they weren't they weren't even aware that this form existed. So we want to make sure that everybody knows the form's out there and that they, they can, you know, contact their school administration. They can contact us and we will uh, do everything we can to support them. Thank you. And, and Dr. I mean, and, um, Captain Kelly, thanks for recognizing the fact that there have been issues over the years and that uh, we now really are facing those issues. We're trying to face those issues head on, but it does take time. So some of the things that we've done to ensure equitable practices, we have really worked on some policy and procedural development. Uh, we have provided professional development to all staff in all schools, and that has started here as a trainer trainer model. And then we have folks that are trained at each of the levels, and then they, that professional development is de delivered at the school level. We have um, hired uh, Ed Modell and Les Stanton, who is here with us, for those of you who don't know Les, um, as equity personnel, and they have provided support to schools and to us. Um, quite frankly, between Brad and I here trying to handle a lot of the issues that come our way along with our other jobs, it has been quite a burden for us, but we have managed to get through all of those cases. Um, our goal is to contact folks within 24 hours notice, and we've done a pretty good job of that. However, with the cuts in budget, there's also cuts in those positions as well, too. And I think that was discussed earlier. So in conclusion, some of the things that we've done. Well, certainly the Campbell, Campbell Jones professional development has been, has been key. We've been doing this for two years now. And so we have a lot of uh, the cultural proficiency strategies uh, with, a, with a nice cadre of staff that have been rolling it out to the schools. We feel like it is, it is in every school at different levels, but it is in every school. And uh, so we feel that that's very important. And we've done some things with restorative practices, co-teaching, diverse learners. Um, Brad had someone from MSDE to come and meet with our administrators about transgender education. We've done a book study across all of our different levels of leadership, and we definitely have ongoing um, data analysis chats about suspensions. And we have revisited the GT and the AP policies because we know there are definitely some inequities there. The way the policy is written, it does leave out some, uh, it, it does not leave room for our, our many of our mar minority students to participate. Um, so we are revisiting those policies. I would like to say it's not a part of, of our presentation because it was sent in earlier, but on Monday, uh, Mr. Engel, um, actually facilitated a diversity celebration at Mattapique Middle School and um, principals had the opportunity to nominate folks or students and it was amazing. It was really one of the best events that we have had all year long. 
Uh, students were recognized, they came up, they received their certificates, they read poems, they were articulating what their vision and their mission and who they were thankful for. It was really amazing how, how much potential and talent we have that's untapped in Queen Anne's County. And that's something that we, we really need to um, <coughs> keep going. So kudos to Mr. Engel, he's uh, my silent partner this year. Um, having the opportunity to work with him this year has really been an honor. Um, because he does take diversity very, very seriously. Um, and also, um, he sang for us at that event as well, too. So um, he, he actually um, played the guitar, and they sang Stand By Me, and everyone in the audience stood by him. So it was, it was very powerful. And Eric Daniels, too. Yeah. And, um, I'd also thank Mr. Paluski for his vision of real recognizing that we have issues <coughs> and making some strides to um, put some procedures and policies in place to address um, our issues. Questions? I would just like to add that I would uh, <coughs> want to uh, appreciate the leadership of uh, Ms. Pauls and, uh, and Mr. Angle as well and give a shout out to Mr. Les Stan who has been a consultant with us over the last, since the letter has gone out. Um, I will tell you, and, and I think I may have said that before, since that letter has gone out, uh, I've been overwhelmed by the number of parents that have emailed me uh, explaining their story and explaining to me things that have happened to them. And uh, although, as Ms. McGowan had mentioned, <coughs> her public comments about our rate, uh, the 1994 race equity audit, uh, we need to do more. And I think the fact that we're talking about this, that this is an issue, that this is a problem, we're going to do something about it, uh, that's a huge first step for us as a school system, as a community, um, as a group of students, because our primary responsibility is to ensure that every child has an opportunity to pre a free and public education in a safe and conducive environment. And so we have a lot of work to do. Uh, we're just beginning kind of climbing this mountain, but it takes all of us together. And I will share with you a very profound mo uh, moment the other night when Ms. Pauls mentioned uh, that Mr. Engel and Mr. Daniels had, had started the song, Stand By Me. And I'd like to recognize Mr. Daniels because he, he made the notion numerous times, please stand by me. Please stand by me. And we joined him. And I'll tell you, it's one of the most powerful moments when an entire group of people get up and we were together and united. And, and that was one of the most wonderful things of the school system. And you've heard me say this a hundred million times. Our greatest strength is our diversity. And I commend the work that we're doing, but we got a long way to go uh, in our school system. So I appreciate everyone's leadership and I appreciate this board's support in this work because it's going to get <coughs> more challenging as we go ahead. Yes. <coughs> okay, so with that, uh, let's move on to 5.03. And since uh, we're only a few days away from summer, uh, I would like to uh, have an update from our summer school program by Mrs. Walbert, Mr. Engel coming back, Mr. Watkins, uh, our math supervisor, and Mrs. Umber that runs our Partner for Youth program. Uh, it is hard to believe that the last this is the last week of school. Friday will be the last day, uh, and it will be one of the longest summers. Uh, so uh, I hope Mr. Engel doesn't get too many complaints at the end of the summer, parents asking for their kids to come back to school. So <laughs> with that, uh, I'll turn it over to our staff. And can I say that all four of them are here because their, <laughs> their leadership is four different programs. So each one of them, Susan will talk about her Title I, Brad his APA program, Rob will talk about a wonderful program that's going to be at Washington College in conjunction with Kim Umberger and Partnership for Youth. So we definitely okay, thank, thank them you. for um, the presentation tonight. Thank you. And thank you, uh, Mr. Paluski and Ms. Pauls, for giving us the opportunity to showcase our programs. We're all very proud of them. Um, the purpose for our, our presentation is to give you an overview of the summer programs offered in Queen Anne's County Public Schools. By the end of this presentation, we hope that you have a better understanding of the Title I and Migrant Summer Program at Southersville Elementary, the Title I and PFY Summer Programs at Graysonville and Churchill Elementary, the High School Summer Program, and the Summer Youth Development and Leadership Academy at Washington College. So the first thing we'll do is I'll share the pieces um, that I oversee. 
there's one slide for Graysonville and Churchill Elementary because their programs really mirror each other. Um, both of those programs will uh, be held from June 26th to the 28th. Um, the grade levels are a little bit different. You'll see down in the chart um, the grade levels for Grace of Elementary are um, all incoming second and fifth graders. And then Churchill uh, serves their kindergarten through fourth grade. You'll see also on the, um, at the very top, you'll see that they run their programs Monday through Thursday. So it's about 18 days. And you'll see that they also utilize the Maryland Summer Fruit Program. So we kind of keep a chart of, of um, our, our facilities serve the food and send the food there to them, but we are reimbursed by the state. Um, under the entrance criteria, so because it's a Title I program, we need to have three uh, data points. And the schools work with um, teachers and the teacher specialists at the buildings really do a lot with uh, lining up the, the students that will attend the program. You'll see the next column is staffing. Um, Ms. Uh, Umberger uh, helps with that part of the funding with, with um, uh, Churchill, yes, with Churchill supplying some staff. Um, you also see in the next column the curriculum that each one of the school uses and then you'll see the funding sources. We combine Title I um, funding sources and 21st century grant. The program for the academic piece, which is the Title I piece, um, is in the morning, and then PFY picks up in the afternoon. Um, Kim, do you want to speak about that now? Yeah, well, in, in appearance, the afternoon program is, uh, it offers a full day of programming for parents, really, so that summer school fits within their schedule. But in reality, it's actually a very, um, rigorous enrichment program for the kids. It provides a lot of opportunities that the participants might not have through the summer in giving those experiences to them. This summer we'll be doing some creative play that has some STEM challenges to it. We'll be doing a theater um, group at both of the schools and then we'll continue our work in the science behind fitness. Okay, so the next slide talks about Southernville Elementary. The funding sources there are a combination of Title I, migrant funds, and also the Judy Center. This program, um, it's kind of the same time frame. The difference is the hours. We are in session from 8 to 3.30 without the support of PFY, so it's a full day program for our students. We do serve, um, as far as our Title I students that attend um, Southersville Elementary during the school year, we, we serve our pre-K, and that would be the, the students who just finished pre-K through fourth grade. Our migrant students we serve, um, we have students from birth to 18 years old. We also utilize the summer food program. Um, you'll see down there uh, in the uh, chart the number of participants. We have about 60 Title I students from Southern Elementary and about 40 migrant as of today. Um, that number could increase. Um, the entrance <coughs> criteria you'll see on there as well. Uh, the Title I entrance criteria, the first three items there, um, as far as migrant criteria, they just need to be a migrant student. Um, staffing, you'll see the staff that we uh, have. We have a part-time nurse and that's part of our migrant budget and also um, that supports the needs of our migrant students and it's also actually a, a part of criteria for us to have that. We do have an EL teacher and also an EL tutor that supports um, the uh, migrant students and uh, with their English learning. Um, you can see the curriculums that are there that we use, uh, math and reading obviously, but we also have unified arts that we build into our program and some STEM activities as well. Actually STEAM, we added the arts in there as well. Um, and then the last uh, column you'll see again is our funding sources, we combine funds between Title I Migrant Funds and the Judy Center as well. Thank you. High School Summer School, uh, this will be my fifth year running what I believe is our best uh, dropout prevention program, our best program for working with at-risk high school students. Um, every year we have about 60 to 70 students that come to our program at Anchor Points Academy, which is behind the Board of Education, and they recover roughly 100 to 120 credits every summer. Um, we feel like this is an excellent program. You can turn to the next slide. 
the, uh, the summer school will start July 3rd and will run till July 27th, Monday through Thursday. We're going to run two sessions again uh, from 8 o'clock till 1045, and then we'll run another one from 11 to 145. We'll be fully staffed with four content teachers and two special educators. We will have transportation that runs from Ken Island High School each morning and returns students back to Ken Island High School each uh, afternoon. And we're going to keep the cost the same. The cost of summer school is $200 per credit. Um, and you can see the, the reduced prices. Um, we're fortunate this year we've got a number of um, community members who are going to help fund and provide scholarships for some of our students. Uh, Clayton Washington at the Kennard Alumni Association has offered uh, five scholarships. And a number of community members as well have offered scholarships to be able to support students that cannot afford to pay the tuition. So we're, we're very happy with that kind of support. And as you can see, those are the courses uh, that we offer. Um, and the courses are done online through Apex. It's credit recovery. Uh, we have an excellent staff. And like I said, I've, we feel like this is a, a great program for kids. And uh, we're going to continue doing it. Okay. Good evening. Um, Mrs. Umberg and I wrote a, were able to write a grant that partners uh, with Kent County. And what we're doing is we're creating a, an academy that targets the, the rising eighth, ninth grade students in the Algebra One from Southernville Middle School. The academy uh, really serves as a 60-hour remediation course and skill building <coughs> course built around the learning sciences and brain research. It inspires kids to really want to strive to be good learners in mathematics and science and arms them with the ability to persevere through challenging situations and to apply, apply good mental strategies in, in, in problem-solving situations. We partnered with uh, Partnering for Youth and with their support, we were able to build a full day program uh, on the campus of Washington College for 14 days from July 10th through July 27th. And we're just very excited to have these youngsters on the, camp on the college campus for three weeks, presenting them with a research-based curriculum. Uh, we're using the Agile Minds Academic Youth Development Program. And being able to take them off campus to uh, many field trips and many experiences they may not have an opportunity to participate in, as well as uh, use some developed PFY events and programs to support them. Additionally, we are going to, uh, for one of the days, we are going to partner with our local Horizons program to create a mentoring opportunity for our, young, our youngsters with their youngsters so that we create a day of, of community and unity so that we can help our students understand how to better interact with the younger peers. Um, the, the teachers, let's talk about, we have three teachers. So uh, essentially we have 20 kids coming from Southernville Middle School and we have 10, 10 students coming from Kent County Middle School. They're coming to the campus of Washington College. We have a teacher from Kent County coming to lead their folks and we have a teacher from Queen Anne's coming to lead our folks. The program is being coordinated by Mrs. Marlo Coppage from Queen Anne's High School. The, really, what we hope to accomplish here is to create uh, a, an environment in which kids are going to Algebra 1 next year prepared to not only be successful there on the park assessment, also to want to continue their track through upper level mathematics and upper level science courses. We believe that the curriculum that we are delivering to the students will arm them with the skills to see themselves into the calculuses and the physics later down the road in high school. We also hope that this is the beginning step of, uh, of making them realize that they are in fact college material and they should be going to college. You can see the list of uh, afternoon activities we are engaging them in. Um, we've partnered with Rivers to the Bay, a grant through Washington College and they'll get five days of environmental science uh, learning. We, we are taking them twice to Echo Hill Outdoor School. There they will uh, participate in an adventure course and, um, and really work on team building and communication skills. We, we are going to work uh, with Camp Pacomath. That's where we'll take the, uh, them and with the Horizons program. We're taking them canoeing one day uh, at, at the Saxophras Environmental Education Center. And uh, throughout the course of the 14 days, they'll also have access to the college pool and the college uh, gym. Uh, additionally, and, you know, just a little small thing, but they'll, they'll eat every day on the campus of Washington College. So they'll go to the dining hall, they'll have, they'll have lunch there. Fun, yes, but they're also getting 60 hours of learning along the way as well. So we, we, we hope that this is the first of, a, of, a, of an opportunity we're able to extend to our students of, of, of pretty kind of a palette of sorts. We're actively pursuing other opportunities to extend this opportunity in further summers. How were the students chosen? Yep, so we set a criteria. What, what, what we did was we let the, the schools pick the students. We, we looked at all sorts of things, all academic data. We looked at attendance. We looked at leadership potential. And what we want to do is we want to try to find 
to 20 kids that when they participate in this camp, it, it'll, it'll, it'll affect their decisions going forward. We, we, we know that the curriculum they're being presented will affect their, their math ability. We, the research behind the program shows that. But we think the other pieces of it are going to inspire them to spread the word that we can learn and, we can, and with a little perseverance and effort, we can be successful no matter what is being thrown at us. And of course, you guys are all welcome to come join us if you are interested in coming out to Washington College for an afternoon and hop in a canoe. We can. We're Thank certainly, you. certainly welcome. Sounds fun. Anything except canoe. <laughs> <laughs> and you're welcome at all the programs. Uh, you know, the the uh, there will be a lot of things going on at all the at all the schools: Graysonville, uh, Churchill, South Isabel Elementary, and then uh, the high school. I'm sure Brad will like a volunteer now and again. <laughs> the last slide just talks about how important that we want to make summer count and, and how important these programs are to us and, and to our, our students. Do you guys have any questions? I did. Um, on the, uh, the high school summer school course offerings that you have, it's, it's $200 for, a, when you say a credit, it's yeah. a class, <coughs> English one. They pay 200 and then they That's right. try to pass it. Well, it, and you said it's uh, it's done with the APEX program, the computer. Now, do they get guidance at APA and then go home and work on it, or how they do you? Can. They can access the course online um, in school and at home, and some do. And basically, they go through modules, and as soon as they finish, they're done. So the, the curriculum is 15 days. Some, pe some of the students get done a little bit earlier if they work hard and are motivated. Okay, but they start out at APA first, and yeah, they and well they they're at a, they at, they're at APA, and then they continue. <coughs> to, if they want to go home and do things, if they want to do homework at night, you know, try to get caught up and get ahead, they can do that as well. Okay. So at the I guess at the end of the school year, um, say they're a junior and they're they haven't got enough credits to go to the senior year somebody sits down with them and says these are offered and here's what you can do and then they look it out at home or how does that the process work I'm well it you know if they fail a course right then they would come to summer school to try to recover that credit back um, and if I mean unless they want to take the course again for original credit but typically they recover the course and that's why it's shorter than the regular regular the course hours uh, we do allow students who've earned a D to attend summer school if they want to to some students who want to maintain their eligibility for sports can come to summer school and bring that grade of a D up to a C not higher than a C um, but they can bring it up to a C and therefore that might get them to that 2.0 eligibility uh, place we have certified staff members that can guide them as well too but yeah oh I'm sorry yeah each there's a content teacher in every area so they're working with them they're not there just working online by themselves they're working with a teacher the whole time oh. Sorry, I wasn't clear about that. <laughs> and oh, and the teachers who teach this, these are these are our own teachers that yes. mm -hmm. volunteer to put a little extra. In As a matter of fact, yeah, it's pretty much the same staff that's been out there for the last few years. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. And all the other schools as well. They're all they're all Queen Anne's County employees. Okay. Thanks. Thank you all for your Thank leadership. You. Thank you. Thank you. 5.04, uh, very quickly, Mr. Farley is going to give you a brief overview on uh, policy development. This was something that the board had uh, requested. So he'll go down through uh, pretty much from policy revision to policy creation, uh, as well as he's going to uh, also we have a variety of policies that are going to be rescinded. And so that will be an action item later on, but he'll go over where those policies are being tweaked re-aligned, uh, if you will, with other policies or completely dropped. That one. Yeah. Is that focused? Can they see No. <laughs> I, no, I don't think it's focused. I'm, yeah. Where do we do it up here? You can. Better. There we go. That's better. better. Is that better? Yep. Okay. Sure. So um, <clears throat> I gave you a paper copy as well and because I knew it would be difficult to turn around and see behind you. But for those of us that um, 
<coughs> that benefit from a graphical uh, representation of the policy on policies. This is how we do what we do. Mr. Paluski and his predecessor and my predecessor made a priority, and so has everybody since. Mrs. Pauls, uh, Mr. Pinder, uh, Ms. Landgraf, we're all making it a priority to get these policies clear. Now, frankly, um, it was a little bit of an archaeology uh, effort to begin with. With me, because we found that we had on the order of 250 or so uh, policies that had to be organized, many of which, I'd say probably more than 50% of which had not been reviewed in more than five years. They were on a CD um, in Ms. Paul's office. They were in a binder with curly yellow pages in the superintendent's <laughs> office. They were in an old book that I don't know when the last time somebody looked at it was. But the truth is that it was Mr. Paluski's initiative to organize, clarify, teach out these policies and to prioritize them through a process. Uh, so I really commend him for all of his work that's benefiting us on that piece. So um, at this point, we have 185 policies, as I told you, that were obtained from a number of sources. Uh, they are all now on the web, uh, and, and people can access them, whatever state of uh, uh, currency they're in. Um, so we had 180, 107 that were adopted since the year 2000. Uh, new 16 newer in process um, and we're going to ask that you rescind 17 policies or uh, because they're redundant or they're covered in other areas uh, pretty straightforward um, so with that we uh, have a number of policies some of which we've already introduced and some of which we know are gap areas for us that we need to get filled in whether that's for a compliance issue or for performance for individuals uh, but certainly all for the benefit of students um, <clears throat> so these are the policies that we're asking uh, to be rescinded we'd like to post this and leave it up for 30 days so folks can comment You'll see, although it's blue on blue, which is a little distracting, and I apologize, each of these is hyperlinked, so you can, uh, you can go to see the, the policy we're asking to rescind, and it explains when it was created, uh, who owns it, and the reason it can be rescinded. All, all that's explained in these PowerPoint slides. And so that's a brief overview of our policy archaeology, and um, we would entertain any questions if you have any. Mr. Farley, do you need a motion for us to rescind those tonight, or that, what are we? It, it, it actually will. It's it's item 7.03. Okay. Yeah. So that's kind of a preview for that under list of policies. You'll see 7.03 okay. yep. is basically uh, your approval to put these rescinded out for a month, yes. so we can get feedback from the public. Um, and then we'll bring that back to you hopefully sometime in July. I do have one question. I took advantage of going online and looking at all these policies and I'm sure it was quite a feat because <laughs> <laughs> I know how data collection works. Um, do we have a list of consequences and punishable actions for each of these policies? I know a lot of it is based on circumstances, ages, school appropriate situations but I've heard from the community resoundingly that they feel there should be some kind of protocol um, two reasons one to ensure it's fairly enforced and one so the parents are aware because a lot of times you know I hate to say it we might take a little harder rain with our kids if we know what the consequences are going to be and give them fair warning sometimes ahead of time you know, kids will act sporadically, but if we've taken the initiative to say, you know, if you toss that pencil across the cafeteria, here's what is going to happen because it's technically throwing a missile in school. 
and that that's Ms. kind of Ms. The way Arnold, it I would defer to, to uh, uh, Janet and Brad. Uh, I assume you're talking so, about student behavior and yeah. consequences. Well, but, per policy, a lot of the policies are, say yeah. like the procedures see consequences, right. or they 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 kind of touch on consequences and appropriate actions. But is there guidelines? So let, let me those? jump in here. So yeah. one of the things we got to make clear, and I think you bring up a very good point, and this is where sometimes I think people get confused between a policy, which is mm -hmm. what the board's role is, and regulations, which is at the superintendents on how we're going to implement that. Right. And then the third piece we have is really a practice that actually takes place at a school or, or multiple schools. So one of the things that we're getting ready to do to ensure that we do, number one, and I'll relate this back to the, the bias incident um, policy which you have before you which is going to be updated. One of the things that we have to ensure is that all of our employees when they come back to school are professionally developed on the policies to ensure number one what is the policy are they aware of it have they been trained on it and then what are the consequences of that whether that's an employee and now we're actually getting into progressive discipline that if an employee breaks a policy what is the the, the consequence the first time the second time third time and, and so forth so we know that we have a lot of work to do in that area as it relates to the discipline piece of that, uh, that's going to be some of the work that we're doing over the summer. Matter of fact, it's a good segue to what Mr. Stanton has been helping us with as it relates to bias-motivated incidents. How do you determine what the consequence is based upon that? And Mr. Angle, as well as Les, have been working on that as well. And we need to provide more professional development. Uh, you know, uh, we're going to be working with them on a variety of scenarios that they, you know, that we encounter on a daily basis. How would you handle that? What consequence would this be? So there's a lot of professional development that has to happen in this as well. Now, I'll make a, another segue to our curriculum management audit. If you remember standard one, which was governance and leadership, and one of the things that we needed to work on was policy development and policy implementation. And this is kind of where it connects into the innovation center and the policies that they're working on to come forward then to be able to implement and then be able to move forward um, with practice as it relates to it. I hope that helps from a kind of a 30,000 foot view. But Mr. Farley, one of the things that we noticed is on our webpage, you couldn't access all of our policies. So the first thing is making sure that the public as well as all of our employees know how to get access to them and our administrators and that it's clear. And, and then now the I believe you can. <laughs> and and no it's trouble. a yes, Mr. Farley's been working on that with his staff, um, and they are posted uh, under the Board of Education, I believe, under that tab. Yep. So we're making some progress in that area, but we've still got some work to do. Great. Thanks, Greg. Sure. Thanks, Thank Mark. you all for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, would you like to move on to 6.01 or we do our schedule? Well, for this a break? is, um, I guess we come to the break. Um, uh, board members would like. Would anyone like to take a 10 minute recess? Mm -hmm. I'm okay with that. No? Nope. It's up to y'all. I'm fine. Hey, I'm fine. You guys okay. need to do this fine with me. Okay. Yeah. So then, um, did you? We take a break. I'm fine with that. Oh, okay. 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 Um, so uh, we'll move on then to um, individual action items. Okay. We'll go into 6.01. Uh, this is the educational facilities master plan. Uh, Ms. Carla Pullen has been doing a wonderful job. Thank I'll you. give her a quick kudos to the uh, Graysonville uh, ribbon or uh, groundbreaking ceremony. Not ribbon cutting yet. Haven't Not built yet. the building, uh, but she's going to give us a quick update and and seek board's approval. Yes. So this evening I'm here to remind you of the educational facilities master plan for 2017. During the meeting last month, we reviewed the requirements for this document, and a draft copy was provided for your review. If you'll recall, this is a state mandated document that we have to provide every year and it's a precursor to our facility planning on a yearly basis and also for any of our funding requests that we are thinking about for fiscal year 2019 for our facilities. I'm here tonight, you will see that you have a final document there uh, at your seats and I would request your approval. We will then forward this to the Maryland Department of Planning before the end of the month and I can answer any questions that you may still have. I had, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't get back to you on this. There's just a couple of the law kind of like, <coughs> won't require a change, just asking. Um, the, do we still have 
portables at Queen Anne's County High School and Kent Island High School? Yes. And what I noticed in the graphs that we have in 2017, the Queen Anne's County ones are supposed to be occupied of 90%, and the same thing up to 2026. So basically, we have no projection of increases of students in Queen Anne's County High School. We do. For Queen Anne's County High School, the projection is smaller than at Ken Island High School, but there are increases that are projected at both schools. With that being said, in our future plans, we had discussed at some point if there is a potential to look at a CTE center, we will do that. If not, at some point we will be looking at the potential for additions to both of our high schools. But I'm just questioning because the, the statistics you have in the table say it doesn't change 90 to 90, so we don't have justification. I mean, if that's the way it reads. It was on like page, I forget what, page 110, I think it was. And, and then Ken Island does say it goes from 105%, which is well over already, well in 2017, 2026 it goes to 113%. Right. Of, capa of, not capacity, but. The facility utilization. Right. Yes. So yes, and how much of that is actually utilized. So that makes it clear, but Queen Anne's doesn't show a, a justification by keeping them the same. I'll have to look more closely at page 110 just to see if, if there you, is some yeah. incongruency between the projections and something that was transferred onto that document, and I'll certainly do that, but we are projecting increases slowly at each of the high schools, but indeed for okay. both. Um, and the other one that uh, was the only thing I think we, since it's not gone yet, but there's one little change I meant to mention to you is um, on page 112. At the end of the paragraph, the very end, we say, for now the board feels it's important to have this project remain in both the EMFP and the CIP. That's the CTE school. Yes. Um, so that our community knows we are working toward addressing CTE needs. And that's where we end it. And I think we should add in there, and future capacity concerns, because the CTE is, is, is about, CTE needs, but it's also a lot about the capacity. Correct. To break away from those portables eventually someday. Correct. So I yes. would keep those together as the justification. That's on page 112. Okay. I'm sorry to do it so late for you. That's okay. We'll a way certainly make the change. Fix, it will help us in the future to, to, for that a whole big justification that we're going to need. Right. Thank you. We'll do. Great, sure. pro great product, though. Thank you. <laughs> a lot of work. And we <clears throat> just need a motion to approve that with the two changes that Captain Kelly had mentioned. I move that we approve the facilities, um, the draft master plan um, as amended with those two minor amendments so you can send it forward. I second it. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it, so we'll move it forward. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to 6.02. Thank you for that. The Graysonville Fire Alarm Construction Bid. As we move into discussion of Graysonville, I just wanted to give you a very, very brief update on the Graysonville Elementary School Addition Project. Um, as I noted to you the last time we got together, we had only one bidder respond to us. That was Whiting Turner. We know that they're a very reputable contractor. We feel very comfortable with them. They have lots of experience in the industry and lots of experience with school construction, especially in this region. Uh, the project is currently over budget, so we're working with Whiting Turner very closely to figure out how to reduce costs. Part of the cost savings that we can uh, provide will be to not use prevailing wage rates for this project. Um, if that indeed happens, the state will reduce a small amount of our funding, but we will still have a cost savings on the overall project, so that is definitely one of the things that we're looking at. We plan to present a contract to you for approval at the July meeting. We plan to begin the construction start for this project now in September. The contractor was able to give us a $60,000 savings for moving the start to September as opposed to July, and we thought that was uh, very wise. The completion date would still be August of 2018, so we haven't moved that out in any way. The change in schedule will not allow us to use the playground at Graysonville Elementary for the beginning of the school year. However, we have negotiated an agreement with Shore Up, who leases the space directly beside 
uh, Graceville Elementary in the old building and they have agreed to allow us to use their playground space from 11.30 to 2 every day. So we do have an alternate Great. place for the students to go. Wonderful. We'll keep you updated as we get closer to the time, but hopefully we'll be talking to you next month about that. So on to the fire alarm replacement portion of this. Um, the fire alarm in the existing building, just to remind you, was installed during original construction in 95. The equipment there has come to the end of its useful life. This is a fiscal year 2017 project that we did receive state funding for. The project was bid to contractors in April. We didn't receive any response. So we then packaged it together with the construction bid for the addition project and received the one bid from Whiting Turner. So what you have before you is a memo that is outlining our recommendation to move forward with the contract for the replacement <coughs> of the fire alarm system in the amount of $220,000. Our project budget and the amount of funding that we have for that is 249000 as part of this, we are recommending that we accept alternate number three, which you will see on the bid tabulation sheet, and that essentially allows us to use product from the manufacturer Simplex Grinnell, um, and that manufacturer is just in alignment. It's consistent with the system that we use in many of our other buildings. I'm here to answer any questions about the bid or explain anything in the bid tabulation. I do have a couple questions. So the $60,000 savings didn't impact anything but start date? Correct. Because they're too busy in the summer to start and they just felt like throwing us a Benny or what? Well, <laughs> it's hard for them to get mobilized that quickly. Okay. And part of what we had written in our contract documents was to have them start on July 1st. Okay. If we give them a little bit of extra time, which we anticipate that they're going to be, after we have the contract signed, they'll be mobilizing and probably be on site doing some work before the end of summer. But just giving them a little bit of flexibility in that time, gotcha. they were able to save some overhead costs on their part. And end date is still the same. Um, yes. And how did that align us into a more um, reasonable area of our budget since we were overbid? We currently are about $50,000 over the available funding that we have for the project. So right there, it's a $60,000 cost savings. From what we have already looked at as reasonable accommodations and changes, um, we're at about $112,000 savings, so we're feeling good about the progress that has been made so far. Great. Thank you. So may I have a motion to approve the Graysonville Fire Alarm Project as presented? So moved. May I have a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. Thank you, Mrs. Pullen. Thank you. Uh, at this point, it will be uh, 6.03, which will be the FY18 budget presentation and approval. Ms. Landgraf and I uh, will present that to you. Good evening, Vice President DiMaggio and members of the Board of Education. For the record, my name is Greg Paluski, Interim Superintendent. I am joined uh, by my colleague, Ms. Robin Landgraf, our Chief Financial Officer. Uh, this evening, we would like to present to you uh, for approval our FY18 budget. Uh, and so we will get started um, very quickly with our purpose. The purpose of this presentation is to summarize what is in the unrestricted operating budget and then to seek your approval on the same. We will then briefly review our construction fund budget and restricted fund budget and ask for your approval on those as well. And I just want to uh, prepare you as well as the audience that uh, we think it's a great opportunity in order to do some education uh, as it relates to MOE as well as uh, fund balance. Uh, this slide is a summary of our original budget request that was sent to uh, the, our county commissioners for consideration. We had requested an additional $3 million uh, from the county 
the preliminary state projection estimated an increase of about $356,000. We projected a slight reduction in local revenues due to the downward trend in collecting, in collecting out of our county tuition, which resulted in an overall request of a little over $3.3 million funding for FY18. In comparison to the last 15 years, this request this year is the third lowest percentage increase that we have requested. This table shows the original request as submitted to county government over that time, the increase in terms of dollars and the percentage over the prior year that increase represents. We believe that we have taken a fiscally, we have taken a fiscally conservative approach with this budget request, but at the same time trying to address some, some of the critical needs that we have as a school system. This slide represents the summaries what revenue uh, we have been allocated. Uh, the county has allocated us an additional $1.3 million to the, board of, to the Board of Education, which represents maintenance of effort. We will attempt to explain this concept in the next few slides. The state funding projections have increased slightly to 374712 The local projections have remained the same. We have added a line for the proposed use of monies from our fund balance to reinstate the media specialists at the elementary schools, effectively using one-time money to preserve these positions. It must be stressed that using fund balance to make it possible to retain the elementary media spe specialists in 2017 and 2018 is not a standard budgeting practice, and it only guarantees the positions for one year. We will have to find another source for funding these positions in the future. There are two items highlighted on this slide that need further explanation. The first, the $1.3 million, which is the required maintenance of effort, and then the second, $264,000 of the fund balance. Maintenance of effort is a funding level imposed by counties by state law. Basically, the county is required to provide as much funding as they did in the prior year on a per pupil basis. To help the public understand uh, this concept, I'm going to use the simplified example um, which are allocated. So for an example, if we had 1,000 students and the county funded 7 million, that would, that would equal about $7,000 per student. So if that goes up by one student, that additional $7,000 in the following year, seven million seven thousand dollars So as it goes up per pupil. But of course, it couldn't be that simple. Uh, the state changed the law in 2012, which required counties to meet an additional condition called education effort. The state now allocates what the county's education effort is by dividing the appropriation given to the board by the county's wealth is expressed as a percentage. The state then compares this percentage to the five-year state average percentage of all counties determined if to meet or exceed that average. If we do not meet this test, then the county is mandated to increase the MOE by lesser of the three amounts. So one, the percentage increase in the local wealth per pupil, and two, the statewide average increase in local wealth per pupil, and step three, which is 2.5%. So in the next slide, in FY17, last year, Queen Anne's County, currently this year, Queen Anne's County, along with 11 other counties in Maryland, did not meet the educational effort criteria. Therefore, an additional amount of NO MOE was imposed by FY or for FY18. When evaluating the three factors, it was determined that the statewide average increase in local wealth per pupil was the least amount of the increase at 2.4%. So this was applied to the required per pupil allocation. This is a copy of the actual MOE calculation. Uh, it starts with the highest allocation given to the board from the county, in this case uh, over $54 million. This is divided by the number of students enrolled in the prior fiscal year, in this case 7,461. Uh, 7, this results in 7,262.50 per pupil. The 2.4% required increase is applied to that figure, resulting in 7,436.80 adjusted per pupil amount. This adjusted uh, per pupil number is the, multiplied by the current year, September 30th enrollment, to determine the required allocation for FY18, which is uh, over 55, slightly over 55 million. An increase over the prior year's allocation of 1.3 million. This is the amount that was funded by county commissioners this year. 
This slide given, uh, gives you a history of what the increases, or in parentheses, the decreases in county funding has been in the last 15 years. The enrollment increases or decreases over the same period of time that requires MOE increases, decreases, the amount of county funding over MOE, and then finally the percentage of MOE that the county provided. So you see that our enrollment uh, has gone up and down, but relatively flat over the next, over the last uh, six or seven years. The only year that the county funded less than the required MOE was in fiscal year 2012, when they cut most county agencies across the state significantly. We here in Queen Anne's County lost $4.5 million that year, over 9% um, of our county's funding. The other item that I hope to clear uh, and help uh, all understand is the understanding the concept of fund balance. Fund balance is sometimes referred to as a surplus or a the surplus. While this is certainly a significant part of fund balance, there are also other items that affect this number, such as the funds that must be reserved to pay for um, what is being encumbered, purchase orders that were open and not received at that year, funds reserved for the, uh, the obligation to employees uh, for leave earned but not yet paid, changes in prepaid expenses, deferred revenues, revenues collected but not yet earned, just to name a few. This money is generated one time and may not reoccur. It must be stressed that using the fund balance to fund ongoing expenses is not a standard budgeting practice. So using to retain the media specialist not only guarantees the may not only guarantee the position for one year. Several years ago, we had made a verbal agreement uh, with our county commissioners at the time uh, to hold this money from the end of the year through the heating season, uh, that if needed, using it for mid-size maintenance projects, such as flooring painting, replacement of heating, cooling systems, security upgrades, etc. These are the only contingency funds available for any type of emergency that we may have as a school system. This slide simply lists the amount of remaining in our fund balance in an effort to be transparent. Uh, our fund balance at the end of the year, over the last 15 years, I think it's very important for our public to understand uh, what those allocations, uh, the fund balance has been. Last year was the highest funded balance we have had uh, over this time period. As you can see, it generally runs of less than 500,000, uh, which with a $90 million, $90 million plus uh, budget, isn't really much of a, of a cushion. The last column shows what percentage this is of our current FY17 operating budget. In most cases, it is less than half of 1%. The next five slides are simply uh, going to show you uh, what has been added to each object in the budget in order to balance the budget for this upcoming school year. This shows salaries and wages. We have uh, an increase in the overall category of 800,000, uh, but the truth certainly lies within the details. Salary improvements for employees um, are really about $1.97 million. Uh, as we've discussed as a board, we've talked about the priority of our employees and compensating our employees, and we've stayed true to that. And the way that we're able to fund this uh, in a variety of ways, and one of those, which is in, con in, in uh, cutting uh, six central office positions, one administrator position at a school. Uh, the projected savings, that's one piece, but the projected savings out of that uh, also, let me backtrack, the, the projected savings out of that is nearly $600,000. Um, we're also projected to save over a little around $400,000 in attrition, and we'll explain that in a second. And we're able to reduce other salaries from attrition and position changes that occurred in this year. This allows us uh, to fund the salary packages, as we've said as a priority, that have been discussed in negotiations. Uh, the positions cut in central office are as follows in the following departments in operations, transportation, uh, our financial department, our instructional supervisor, instructional facilitator, secretary to an instructional facilitator, our community liaison, and the assistant principal at Kent Island High School Annex. And our contractual obligations. Our contractual obligations are primarily made up of the contracts with our four LLC uh, companies that provide transportation to our students. If you remember, we reverted, uh, uh, we avoided, excuse me, a transportation crisis at the beginning of the year. If you recall, we did not have a transportation contract the Friday night before school opened. Um, this is another good example of trying to be fiscally conservative, but also to be able to maintain uh, an open school on time. Uh, we've also included funds for legal services and maintenance contracts. 
Supplies and materials, supplies and materials uh, had essentially, there's no growth. However, we did uh, reduce some line items uh, while increasing others. One item that should be noted is our software license agreements. Uh, there's little money in the budget actually for our software licensing agreements for our curriculum, uh, certainly used within the classrooms. Many of those that we actually purchase with end of the year money. So even though they're budgeted, we're not able to pay for those and we use end of year money to be able to maintain the, the programs uh, that we have. Um, we're doing this with as many software licenses, certainly, as, as we can afford. But this is another example of how we're using end-of-the-year money to supplement and pay for things that should actually be in our budget. Uh, other charges, uh, there are basically two items that are driving the cost in this, ca in this category, payroll taxes and health insurance. The payroll taxes have been uh, calculated on the salaries included in the budget. Health insurance is anticipated to increase 3% for the upcoming school year. Luckily, we had reserves hence a fund balance, uh, in the ESMEC Health Alliance, and we were able to buy down our premium increases. Without using some of the money available in the reserves, we would have, to, we would have experienced approximately 8% increase, uh, as did many of our neighboring counties around us. So uh, in short, we're able to not pass that off to our employees. We're able to draw that down so the cost of the employee is at a much lesser rate. Equipment, the last two objects in our budget are equipment and transfers, and you can see we've made relatively small changes uh, to these figures in these two areas. That brings us to the summary of all the additional expenditures included in our FY18 budget. This is a summary of the last five slides, which total to the amount of the new revenue uh, we are to receive uh, in the upcoming new year. Unrestricted revenue, this is just a repeat of the revenue slide shared with you earlier uh, to give you a little bit of a, of a summary. And this certainly concludes uh, this half of the presentation on our unrestricted operating budget. If you have any questions, we'll be happy to answer those, and then we can move into the construction side uh, of the funding as well. We'll move on to construction funding. Uh, on the construction side, uh, this is a list of the projects. Uh, Mr. Pender did an outstanding presentation when he talked about all the projects that are going to happen in the summer. This is a construction fund to be able to show you specifically where that money is coming from, what is picked up at the state. This is a list of projects that we have requested for FY18 with the state and county funding for each project. Uh, if you'll notice uh, that no funds were received for band uniforms at Queen Anne's County High School, uh, classroom technology, facility assessments, recommendation, general building improvements. Since these items were not funded as part of our capital budget, we wrote a letter to our county representing the use or the parts of our funds, including the band uniforms, which you'll notice in, uh, in my letter that was sent out, um, the press release, we talked about using the fund balance that over 500 and almost $600,000, which was used towards uh, those projects. The last section of our budget are, the budget are the restricted programs. These are grant funds received from the federal, state governments, and other sources such as the local management board or the LMB. First are listed the federal grants received, and these are estimated amounts as the final grant awards. Uh, will not be available until after the fiscal year begins. Next are state grants in the restricted funds. Then we will have the grants certainly from other sources. And finally, this is the summary uh, of all of our grants that we anticipate a slight decrease in the grant funding received based on a reduction in carryover grants. And with that concludes our FY18 budget. Ms. Landgraf and I would be um, happy to answer any questions that you may have and seek your approval on a balanced budget for FY18 given the funding that we have received. Yes, Captain Kelly. Mr. Pelosi, I know we had talked about this before, but um, I'm still very concerned about the loss of the uh, IT facilitator. Um, and we received public comment today ab about that. Um, it is a one, one position that handles, as uh, Mr. Brown said, all of the computers in the system as far as the training and preparation for using those. I don't think things are going to get any easier <coughs> on the, that side. And I'm still concerned, and I still think we should not do get rid of that position. Um, there's 
the public, I've gotten some input from public that there is a concern that we haven't been using the computers as much as we should um, and as much as we could. And we put a whole lot, the, co the commissioners have put a whole lot of money into us for this one-to-one -one concept. And um, I just think we're shooting ourselves in the foot by getting rid of that position. So I want to make that well known. And when we, if, if it's impossible, we have no other options is what you're telling us. Um, we need to get that position back in any way we can. Um, uh, I also want to mention about the budget itself, and I think you, you articulated it very well. And I want to make sure the public fully understands in kind of layman terms, because you put some great information in there. Um, we're familiar with all that. But sure. the bottom line is we're going to start next year in a big hole. Uh, because this fund balance, as you stated simply, is a one-time solution to our problems. Correct. Um, so we'll have a shortfall there. And because the commissioners are, um, are really do give us MOE, uh, and that's pretty much all we can expect f is for MOE, just like we happen to have this year, um, I, I think it's important that the public understands that if we want to do any further compensation for the teachers and the administrators, if we want to give them a step or a COLA or anything, that's all on top of MOE. And you showed that that, that is about a $1.9 million or close to a $2 million um, item for salaries and for steps year. and sure. COLAs. And all. That's sure. all because that also includes the payroll taxes and everything that goes with the position. So if we want to give even uh, anything we, the 1.9 million we're doing this year for what we're trying to do, that puts us in a $2 million, $2 million hole. So basically anything on top of MOE we want to do, we have to go search for more things like cutting more positions. So the public needs to understand that and so do the um, associations that represent the employees. So it's important that we're, we're going to work to get a budget may be approved earlier next year so that then the associations and the public can come out and work and come to the budget hearings that the commissioners provide in support of what budget we put forward. This year we had very little input from parents, definitely very little from teachers, um, and, and it's just important that we go lockstep in front of the commissioners to get more than MOE or else we have to cut positions to Pay, pay raises, to, sure. to fund pay raises. Um, I have an, I, I, some ideas. Maybe we need to engage the public ahead of time on ways to solve these, help us solve these problems. Um, I was thinking through this when reading this budget stuff for preparation that maybe, first of all, we do need to move on immediately on getting prepared for a new bus contract when our contract's in that we currently have. They were a huge, huge, we got a huge hit. When we didn't have it, um, have it resolved before we had to start school, we pretty much got shafted um, and had to pay a lot of money for these contracts, and we've had to pay them, and we had to lock into a three-year contract, I believe it was. So it's important that we get busy and start looking at ways to save on the bus contract um, the next time it comes up. And I know that's a long process, and I know you're talking about doing that. But the public needs to understand that. We got shafted on the bus contracts, in all honesty. And I'm glad that maybe we can start looking at some other ways to save money on bus contracts. Um, also, an idea that we do a serve, maybe do some kind of a survey um, to, per to get input from the public on maybe some ideas, if they have them out there, how we can save some money, areas where they think maybe we're wasting money. I don't mind hearing from the public on it, because we run out of ideas on our own. Um, ways to improve our budget. It's not only looking for things we can cut, maybe ways we can consolidate or reorganize, uh, or maybe you have, we have projects out there or things that we're doing, programs that are, aren't being effective, so maybe the public can come forward and say, we really don't see the benefit from this program and help us, help us have some ideas to save some money. And, and the other thing is it would be good in a survey like that. I, know, I don't know how surveys work, really, but if there was a way to get input from the public on what they consider priorities. Sure. We always say our priorities are our are, are, uh, compensation for employees in this, and the class sizes. Sure. And that's what we've been living by and try to, to support. 
But maybe the public has other ideas of the priorities that we should be thinking about, maybe instead of, or perhaps, probably in addition to. <laughs> so I recommend we, we engage the, the community in this and um, see where we can get some help on trying to solve these, these issues. Um, so that's the main thing I wanted to get across. Sure. Thank you. Uh, so um, I guess at this time we need to um, have a motion to approve the FY18 budget. Correct, Mr. Pruluski? Yeah, we are seeking uh, the, the board's approval yes. uh, for the FY18 budget as presented okay. uh, so that we can move forward um, primarily. And that's one thing I'd like to commend the board on is, is staying true to their priority of employee compensation. Um, the board has stayed true to that. We've stayed true to that as a team. Uh, I think that speaks volumes to our employees, um, but it also is not without a push and pull factor when you Absolutely. trying to make one thing happen, but something else has to give. And, and those things that give are causes to larger things um, that we have to tackle. But yes, at the end of the day, we are seeking your approval um, for our FY18 budget so that we can move forward and begin to prepare uh, for the upcoming school year. So may I have a motion to approve the F? Y18 budget as presented. So moved. May I have a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. No. The ayes have it. Thank you. And, and with that, uh, to frame this conversation very, very quickly, because we felt very strongly, you know that when we've gone through the budget process, we said one of the things, and this has been a common vision with the Board of Education and our county commissioners, is really looking at a five-year operating budget. And we felt that it was very important today to do the best that we can here in June to give you a fiscal forecast of what FY19 could look like based upon the decisions that we make today. And I'll turn that over very quickly for a very brief uh, presentation by Ms. Landgraf. Okay, so the purpose, as Mr. Pelosi just said, is to just make everybody aware of the challenges that we're going to have facing us in the upcoming years. Um, salary challenges, that's obviously the, since 85% of our budget goes into our people. Um, a step increase generally averages about $1.2 million a year. A 1% COLA is going to be about $670,000 next year. And if we were to give a 1% increase for employees who were not eligible for a step, that generally runs around $170,000. So right there, you're over $2 million already um, before you even start. Health care, that's another challenge that we have. Um, we've, been a we've been lucky in the last couple years that we've had very good experience, and we've been able to have a reserve at the es ESMEC Health Alliance. Um, and we've been able to use that reserve to help re offset some of our premiums. Over the past five years, two years, we've had relatively no increase. For three years, we've had a 3% increase. Um, a 1% increase for our active employees will cost about $105,000. So a 3% increase would be about $315,000. Um, for retirees, a 1% increase is about $20,000 plus any new retirees we have. And each new retiree that we add to the rolls um, costs us about $6,300 a year. So other bu uh, budget challenges that we have, bus contracts. We've talked about this before. Right now, there is a fuel escalation clause in the contract. We do not have any money budgeted in our budget for that fuel escalation clause. If diesel fuel goes over $3 next year, that clause will kick in and, and we, will have, we will have a budget problem if fuel goes up. Um, the annual increase in the, in the contract is based on the CPI. The 10-year average for that CPI is about 2.13 percent, a little over 2 percent, and the cost of that's going to be about $110,000 a year for just that. And then any new additional buses that may be purchased, there will be additional costs for that. Some other items, staff for class size. Um, even though our overall enrollment may not be going up, individual schools and individual classes sometimes we have a, you know, a peak number of students who are there and it's not always reasonable to be able to shift staff from one building to another. Sometimes we actually need to purchase uh, or, you know, invest in new staff. Um, staff for program improvements. One of the things that we've talked about for the last couple years has been gateway to technology at the middle schools, trying to get that program in. 
Um, there's other programs that we would like to be able to institute that we just don't have the funds for. Staffing for pre-K, that's another one. Early elementary school, our early elementary, the earlier we can get them in, the better off. We're only offering um, pre-K to those students who qualify. We'd like to be able to, you know, extend that a little bit to others. And then, of course, the use of fund balance to maintain media specialists. Again, we've said that's not a good budgeting practice, and that's going to put us behind next year. Um, the other item that I didn't put on here that I should have as we were going through the other presentation, we talked about software licenses. We have very little <coughs> money budgeted <coughs> next year's budget for software licenses. It's not enough to cover what we currently are using in the classrooms. We're using money that we have now in order to purchase those software licenses for the future year. Sometime that's going to catch up to us. At some point in time, we're not going to have the money at the end of the year to buy those ahead, and we're going to have to uh, deal with that. And I just want to add one thing to that, but that we also recognize that's an area that we need to explore further in order to, sh to see what it is that we're actually using and its effectiveness. The same thing when it comes to reading interventions. I think it was something that Mr. Ms. Uh, Captain Kelly had said. What are the interventions that we have? How much do they cost? What students are in them? And how effective are they? And if they're not, then we need to do some restructuring of how we're using those and how we're funding those to restructure that from within. So that's a, just a quick example. Didn't our curriculum audit dictate that as it well? It did. It did. As a matter of fact, Innovation Team 5 is working on that. They're looking at all the interventions right now, lining them up, looking at the data, then Mrs. Landgraf's going to start putting dollars beside them, and then we can look at do we need to eliminate one of those interventions and maybe add more money to an intervention that's working right. show here's the money we have, right. are we using it effectively to the bottom line? Okay. Um, and then enrollment challenges. Uh, both of our state enrollment and our county um, funding is based off of our enrollment. And as you can see, over the last 10 years, we've only had an increase of 30 students. That's less than a half a percent increase over 10 year period of time. And that drives our funding at both the state and local levels. And then last, again, we just throw this slide back up here where we were this year. Again, we were the third lowest request over the past 15 years. Um, we would like to continue that fiscally conservative approach, um, but as you can see, we have some significant challenges ahead of us. So. I'd just like to say I made a comment back when Mr. Paluski um, first presented this budget, and I don't think if people realize really that there's a lot of budget workshops that go on in a budgeting process, and we're fortunate enough to be a part of that, but that's also in the public um, can view those. I attend those at the county level as well. It's, it's pretty um, enlightening to see how big a task it is. The one thing I mentioned back in March was this budget that was presented as the third lowest budget in 15 years, which I knew just because I followed the budgets for 15 years, had no student suffering in it. There were no cuts to staff, no cuts to programs. Our students weren't being impacted one single bit and we were able to present and negotiate a compensation package that I hadn't seen come across this county's desk in many many years. Unfortunately it didn't come to fruition and we're going to have to face the fact that that's probably going to become a trend. So we are as Dr. Kelly, as um, Captain Kelly said, more than willing to have community input as to where you think we can find additional resources doesn't even always have to be about dollars people are resources sure and um, sure. we welcome your input Thank well you. and and as presented right here we're already starting on FY19 and 20 and 21 yeah. right. um, and and we'll do that we started for the very first time Captain Kelly brought up the suggestion of a survey we did a survey this year uh, didn't get a lot of feedback but that's we'll continue to work on that uh, and we'll continue to get the word out and seek for help and seek to understand uh, the complexity that it is to put a public school budget together, uh, that there are a lot of push and pull factors. Thank you, Ms. Harlow. Thank you, Mr. Polinski. Any other questions for us? Okay. Thank you. Uh, so
So we will six point six point oh five, which is going to be uh, the Queen Anne's County the Board of Education has uh, requested their handbook approval, uh, which is being updated. Um, so it's uh, during the May 17 work <coughs> session, Mrs. Harlow moved to have the board handbook updated. May I have a motion to approve the updates as presented? So moved. May I have a second? Second. All in favor oh, say. Discussion. I, the, the, uh, I, I read through it um, and we've got the student board members names on there. We, all we changed in the whole thing were names. Really, there's no other changes in the in the handbook. Right, you're right. Not at so this point. So the student, point. yeah. And also we have That's down. That's right. Um, we need to go back and do point. that. That's right. We just changed that one page, right? Well, on page three we have um, 2017, the 2018. Yeah. And the superintendent listed under 2017, 2018. There's some errors. There's some errors in it. Yeah, yeah. Do that. yeah I don't. That happens, I don't think session. we should approve it. That was the only no, thing we I were agree. changing. I agree. Right, and because we also have to change the edited date. Yeah. Eventually, so, but we have also we, talked about some further changes. So yeah. maybe we should just maybe wait. we should just do it all instead that, of just the names. Idea, Dr. Um, Kevin yeah, Kelly. at one time. I'm fine with that. Yeah. Thank you, because I think we are moving along, which you yeah. wanted to do. But yeah. right. you would like to table that yes. until you have Let's further discussion on it. Yeah. Yeah. Until we have make more mm -hmm. edits. Yes, okay. absolutely. Okay. Okay. Six point oh six is our uh, HR report. Board members, Mr. Paluski, I would ask that you approve the HR report as proposed. I make a motion that we approve the HR report as presented in closed session. And I have a second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. Transportation report. 6.07, transportation report, Mr. Pender. Yes, Gene Clark has a bus that is 15 years of age and will no longer be able to be used in service. He is looking for permission to purchase Troy Lee's bus number 6110, and then Mr. Troy Lee would um, replace that bus with a new bus. I make a motion that Gene Clark be approved to purchase bus 6110 and Mr. Troy Lee to purchase a new bus. A second. <coughs> All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. The ayes have it. 6.08, this is the textbook. This is our uh, the second and the final uh, before the board. We have uh, science through, which is environmental science, uh, global concern, um, science uh, dimensions and science and global issues. Uh, Ms. Pauls, I do not believe that we have received any comment, uh, so we would seek the board's approval for <coughs> final adoption of these texts. May I have a motion to approve the environmental science, a global concern, the HMH science dimensions, and the science and global issues, a biology textbook? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. 6.09, this is a field trip, Kent Island High School uh, choir to Walt Disney World in, uh, in December. We're seeking your approval. Make a motion that we ex um, approve the field trip for Ken Island High School Choir to Walt Disney World December 6th through December 10th. Second, Second. motion. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. 610, this is a field trip for Queen Anne's County High School, the FFA, Future Farmers of America, uh, to the Maryland FFA State Convention in Lithicum. Uh, at the end of the month, here in June 26th to the 28th. Make a motion that we accept the field trip, Queen Anne's County High School FFA to Maryland FFA State Convention in Lithicum, June 26th to 28th. May I have a second? Second the motion. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. Guys have it. Great. 7.01. These are our policies for the second time before the board. One is uh, the revision to our field trip, and the other one is our curriculum uh, management policy. And Mr. Farley, if I remember correctly, I have not seen any uh, public comment on those two policies. Correct. Correct. So we ask the board move that for, the, for its second read. Board members, are there any comments, questions, or discussions regarding these two policies? 
May I have a motion to allow the field trips and curriculum management policies to remain on the QACPS website for a third and final read? So moved. May I have a second? Second. second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. The ayes have it. 7.02, these are policies coming before the board for the very first time. Uh, our student wellness and nutrition policy, which we are required by law to be able to have. Um, our bullying, harassment, and biased behavior, you know that uh, part of the letter going out, we went back and did some revisions. Uh, we'd like to bring that forward now for public comment so that we can uh, get that approved by August so we can begin the training. Uh, also in tandem with that is our student discipline policy that we've updated. This also will help us in revising our student handbook. Uh, and last, as in the last uh, board meeting, we brought back the drug and alcohol free policy. Um, so we'd like to request bundling all four of those policies to go out for the first time for public comment. May I have a motion to allow the four policies to be placed on the QACPS website and sent to our stakeholders for a first read? So moved. May I have a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. Uh, thank you for that. 7.03, this is the policies to be rescinded. Uh, re re if you recall Mr. Farley's presentation, we would like to seek the policies to be rescinded to go out for public read for 30 right. days for comment. Okay. May I have a motion to allow the policy rescind list to be posted on our website before removing them from our system? So moved. May I have a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. 8.01, the interim superintendent report. Uh, wow, did the month of uh, May go very, very quickly. There were uh, numerous events uh, just about uh, every evening from the Ken Island High School uh, Honor Society luncheon. Uh, but I will tell you, uh, certainly the highlight of the month is graduation. Uh, and our graduation that I know that I attended uh, with our staff uh, and uh, our board members, the Queen Anne's County High School uh, was an outstanding. I thought it was great to recognize the f uh, alumni that were there over 50 years ago. I think it was just a wonderful thing. Kudos to Ms. Hudock and her whole entire team um, uh, of the work that they have done. Uh, same thing to Mr. Schreckengost. Uh, what a wonderful evening that was as well. Uh, and it was uh, a kudos to his staff uh, and, and all of us for being there to, to support them. Uh, but most importantly, it was so exciting to see the passion in so many of our students as they graduate. Is that P-A-S-S-I-O? -S -S yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Captain Kelly, it is. I can't tell you how much, uh, how much Kelly, razzing yeah. I've, I've taken over that. <laughs> Uh, but you know what? And, and Mr. Pender is probably the first one that, that reminds me uh, and, and is very passionate. Google it. Uh, Google it. But people remember that. But people remember that. So that was an exciting event and very exciting to see this next group of graduates uh, move on in their lives and, and come back. And I appreciated it to be there with all of you. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to 8.02. Actually, uh, I, have, I have a thing on that. The uh, awards, I w you all should attend some of these award ceremonies. They're fabulous. The Ken, I know the, that you did and Ms. Paul's, the Ken Island High School Awards Ceremony and the Queen Anne's. I went to both of them, and they were senior just senior awards nights. They were fabulous. They're long, but it's just amazing the amount of scholarships that our our students get. Um, I didn't get the figure on Queen Anne's, but Ken Island was seven, um, seven to eight million dollars worth sure. of scholarships. Um, and so I think it's important that the public knows that. I, I know Queen Anne's had quite a few too. We so we, we might want to, you know, get get that advertised also. It's a, I think it's an excellent idea, Captain In particular, Kelly. get the same, I would recommend the same, to figure the amounts the same way for both schools, because otherwise it gives a yes. false impression, and everybody is always comparing. But I know there were quite a few at Queen Anne's. It was very Absolutely. Long. I'll put uh, Miss Harrison on that right away, and uh, she'll make sure that we get that out so we publicize that. I think it's a great thing to share. Yeah. Uh, we we'll certainly look at each one of those and then combine how much money. Uh, it's purely amazing. <laughs> and, and the other one is the – apparently you went to the Maryland State Teacher of the Year. I lunch. did. You know, for – Previously, the the whole board has been informed of that, and we've gone as a 
quite a couple members of the board at the same time. I didn't oh, realize absolutely. that was over. But it was a real good event I went to last year, and I just didn't know anything about it. So maybe next year um, everyone could uh, at least be invited. I was invited. I w actually, Arlene was invited. Um, but because of um, her illness, um, then it was passed on to me. So I'm assuming that it was the president of the, the no, board that was invited because of the seats. No, it's usually we were all allowed to go last year so, so. if we wanted to. So well, just well, for future. Sure. And, and that's part of our communication of upcoming events. We'll certainly be happy to do that. Right, ma mainly to for, f to support the the, sure. uh, oh, was, the person that great we effect. have, um, um, Marsha McNeil and her husband. Right. Great. Okay. Great. Thanks. I'm gonna turn it over to my partner in crime, 8.02, uh, <laughs> Miss Janet Pauls. <laughs> me. Um, I just like to Gosh. give um, <laughs> kudos to the CNI team, who, as you can see from all of their minutes, have worked tirelessly attending state and local meetings. They're now preparing for summer um, curriculum writing. Even though we'll be down three people, I can say that the volume of work um, that they will continue to produce will be high quality and will be um, truly match what uh, our students um, deserve here. So we have, as uh, Captain Kelly suggested, we have um, downsized, but we have consolidated many of the jobs and they have taken on additional responsibilities. And I guarantee you the same quality of work will be done because they are exceptional folks. Um, I've also been out, as you can see from the report, out and about in the schools. It was my goal to visit each school at least four times this year. Some it may have been three, but for the most part it was at least four times. And kudos again to all of the educators who are working tirelessly in our system. And school ends on Friday, and they deserve this well-earned um, rest. And then I had the opportunity to uh, attend many school events, graduation, both award ceremonies. They were rather long, but <laughs> it was <laughs> worthwhile. Um, this graduation was very meaningful to me because the students that graduated were kindergarten students <laughs> when I began as principal at Church Elementary yep, School. That's right. So I knew many of those students, so it was very meaningful. Um, two events that I'd also like to highlight was the Jump Rope Show at Church Elementary School that um, was put on by April Quigley. It's always a great event, and it was wonderful. And then the Jazz Festival that was held at Queen Anne's County High School, which showcased Queen Anne's County High School, Sutlersville Middle School, and Centerville Middle School. It was really a very, very nice event um, and very well attended. And then I'd like to thank each and every one of you for allowing me to be a part of your esteemed team team this year. It has been an honor, and hopefully I have served you well, and I have enjoyed it. So I look forward to all of the great things that will continue to come from this team. Um, this is my last evening meeting, but we have one more day meeting, so thank you. Thank you for all your hard work, Janet. You've been a wonderful asset to our, to our team. Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> And fun. Kudos. Even, even sitting beside Mr. Pender. <laughs> <laughs> I brought a tissue for the. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would have Jeff to turn the camera off, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, now we're at the. Um, the citizen participation nope. expenditure report. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. 8.03. 8, 8 Please forgive uh, me, Miss Robin. That's okay. <laughs> totally We're skipping good. over the money issue tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Might as well. Um, <laughs> Ms. Robin, please. <laughs> we have two reports in front of you. The first report is kind of a gives it by category. And you can see that we do have one category that is now officially in the red, and that's transportation. Um, we will be look, keeping an eye on that for the last couple days of school here, and then determining how much money we actually need to transfer in to cover those expenses. Um, on the second report, which has a little more detail to it, there are some line items within categories that need to have some transfers made to them, but they are within category, so that's just a matter of writing a letter to the county commissioners to let them know we're doing that. Once again, I want to say that we're going to be possibly moving money to um, it, um, instruction in order to cover those software licenses that we're looking to um, cover for the end of, for next school year because we don't have that in the budget for next year so we'll be reviewing all these categories and possibly doing that where do where do I find them on here the the licenses that you're talking about they would be under the um, instruction category category four under supplies and materials um, it's part of that line item 
seven hundred thousand of that line item. Okay. Yes. Yeah, okay. yeah. There's a there's nine hundred sixty four thousand dollars on the line item. That <coughs> includes all the materials of instruction, which is over seven hundred thousand that gets allocated to the schools. Okay. Plus the media supplies, which is another <coughs> hundred thousand that gets allocated to the schools. Okay. So that only leaves about one hundred sixty four thousand for all other instructional materials. Okay. So. What do, what does um and I know I should know this, but what is the cost of the licenses that? Well, Agile Minds just by itself right. is almost $100,000. Um, then you have Star 360, which is another $85,000. We have Alexandria, the SERS program, Discovery right. Education. Right. Um, probably when you put them all together, you're in the neighborhood of three <coughs> or $400,000. And, and as I mentioned, that, that's something that we really have to take a look at. And there's I not an organization today that doesn't have an ongoing, you know, once you buy something, you have an ongoing cost. Exactly. We have to get a handle on that. Right. And I think exactly. there's some areas there that we can cut back on, but right. that'll be part of our five-year projection. We know right. that's an area to dig into. Good okay. questions. Okay. And I think it is worth mentioning, though, that out of an over $88 million budget, it's just phenomenal that Ms. Landgraf keeps us down to how close we are to being right. Um, and it's a lot of work over the year and also the projections and all that. So w it's amazing that you can get right here with three days, two days, two days of school left. So thank, thank you, you, Rob. Yes, thank you, Robin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now I guess we... <laughs> citizen participation. Then. If we have anyone that wants to um, speak, citizen participation, public comment one more time. Do we have to read it again? Uh, Dave and White here. I don't don't think so. Just one more question. Uh, I know I, I heard tonight that uh, the media specialists, or is this a one time funding? It, uh, it is, so, right, and this certainly isn't, isn't meant to be a, a, a question and answer period, but uh, yes, it's going to be used in, in, we're using fund balance, which is one time. And all I have to, have to say is look at uh, the Comar regulations, make sure that you met them and that uh, you have sent in to the state your reasoning because I, uh, you're going to have to have a waiver to get rid of that, that particular position. It's not like it was at the middle school. Um, let's see. Upcoming meetings and events. Uh, our next work session meeting is scheduled for next Wednesday, June 14th. Eastern Shore Consortium Summer Education Conference is scheduled for June 19th at Chesapeake College. Um, board members, do you have anything or um, superintendent? Do I do. I would just like to uh, uh, add echo just one one quick comment um, this is certainly uh, my last evening meeting uh, as an interim superintendent uh, I look forward to whatever role that I serve uh, in this school system if I get a chance to sit here or if I get a chance to sit somewhere else uh, but with that being said uh, I first want to recognize Miss Pauls um, she has done an outstanding job I could have not done this job without her uh, and I think she um, deserves an applause. she does she is an exceptional leader. Uh, she is, as you know, well-respected, uh, well-connected, and I say this any time when I go with her, and it's a testament to the kindergartners that just graduate. She's literally a rock star in Queen Anne's County. There's not <laughs> yes, anywhere that I go that someone <laughs> doesn't come up and hug her and say how much they appreciate. So uh, I appreciate uh, not only her friendship and her professionalism, uh, Thank you, Janet, for, for your service, yeah. uh, and I look forward to all of our work together. Uh, with that said, I really want to say thank you to the Board of Education. Uh, it has been great to work with you uh, and, and all the work that we've done together with the executive team as well, and I know that, that uh, you have decisions to make, and, and I look forward to serving uh, Queen Anne's County Public Schools in whatever role that I can, uh, and certainly to echo the passion that I have for this <laughs> school system. So I thank all of you, and, and I appreciate uh, your trust and, and faith in me um, to run the school system for a year. I appreciate that. Thank well, you, Mr. Poliski, I do believe, and Greg, because that's too formal, 
Um, from the bottom of my heart, I would like to thank you for what you have done for us um, this year, what you've done for our children, what you've done for our uh, teachers, our staff, um, what you've done for central office, everything. I would like to sincerely thank you thank for you. what you have done. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. I echo that. So, if nothing else, may I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. Motion adjourned. Thank you.